welcome to Kensington. We're so glad that you're here. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing and celebrate our incredible God who is with us. He is present in the room, so we stand in honor of his presence. Let's sing together. There's peace that outlasts darkness. And hope that's hidden in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today. That's Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow. For tomorrow's in your hands. Now all I need, you will provide. Just like you always have. Cause I'm
doing good today? Man, I love that line in that song that says, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. And that's, that's good, because there's a lot of days in my life I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work out, God. What's happening? And it's the hope and the faith that we have in him that carries us through day to day. I, I tell you what, I don't know how people do it without faith in Jesus. Like, every day, I'm like, if I didn't have hope, I don't know that I'd make it through it. That's why we sing. That's why we get together here. That's why we're around other people that are like-minded. We have a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He loves us the same as we can read about in Scripture. We see the way he's put his power, his might, his love for us on display, and we're just going to run to that same God together today. on the God of Jacob whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the Call this out to so, oh God.
that you are the same yesterday, forever, and always. That God, when we don't know what's coming up, you do. Help us to have the faith in you always. This morning, would you speak to us in a way that we didn't anticipate when we woke up this morning? We love you, we sing to you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we sing and we pray, amen, amen. You guys are welcome to take a seat. That was so good. How is everybody? We have the uh, good, man. What a great day. And it's been like a beautiful weekend. Come on up. We have got a child dedication we get a chance to do today for an amazing man named Noah. I like that name. My middle son's name is Noah. Hey, dude, how are you? Have a high five? All right, cool. You want to send in that green spot? They put green spots in here because somebody fell off the stage before, and so now they worry about it. I, I don't know what the deal is. So. <laughs> It's a beautiful opportunity to say, why, why do we do child dedications? Why do we do this together, you know, on stage? Because it's a community thing. It takes a tribe, it takes a village to raise a family um, in a big way. Marie and I know this in a very profound way. We, we need help. We often are like, we, we could use help <laughs> in doing it this way. But there's something amazing when you look at it biblically. There's a lady named Hannah in the Old Testament. And she had prayed for a child, and God gave her a child named Samuel. And this child, she had promised as she had prayed, God, if you give me this child, I will dedicate this child back to you. And that is surely what she did. And she had postured and positioned and placed his life and her life in raising that child the way that Kristen and Kevin are going to be raising Noah. Didn't know who their God was. Know the God that gave him life, the God that brings life to us, perspective and hope and power in a way that we can't even imagine. And we dream big things for our kids, do we not? As the community, I want you to know here, it's a big emphasis for us. Our kids' ministry, our family ministry, we got student ministry right now, raising money for mission trips. Like, we want to invest in the next generation. Do you agree with me on this? Like, we're all in there. And so this is why we do this publicly in this moment. It is a sacred moment. And in these sacred moments as parents we have, we, we dream of our children. I know I dream for mine still. And there's moments I think, man, my son, he could be the president of the United States. And then you hear another kid yell out, Dad, Isaac just put cheese that's down the floor vent. And I'm like, maybe vice president God. I don't know. I'm just like, but I'm dreaming, right? <laughs> and it's not easy at moments of parenting, but there's this beautiful reality. It's one thing to say things to your kids. You will say, say, I want you to do it this way. And I want you to put your shoes on. I want you to go to school and get, you can say all you want. But what you show them is what sticks. My mentor said that more things are caught than taught. It means more things that you show them will stick with them than what you say to them. And so it's also a huge deal as we get ready to pray today that we're not just praying over Noah, that we're praying over his parents, and that we're praying over that God would give you a blessing of patience, perspective, power, all sorts of things that you need to raise your children in. I was going to, if it's okay with you, I wanted to read a little excerpt from the letter, unless you guys wanted to. Chris said it may be okay to do that. So, <laughs> okay, no problem. And so I just I read this, and it's amazing. It says, Noah, it says, from the moment we met you, we knew our lives were being transformed for the better. You are a strong-willed, fiercely independent, brave little boy who we are so incredibly blessed to have in our lives. And the scripture that we would say over you that your parents wanted you to know, buddy, that we would even affirm over your life as a community today, is Joshua 1.9. It says, Be strong and courageous, and do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Isn't that amazing to know as parents, I think one of the biggest things is to know that wherever your sons go, that God goes with them. Because there comes a point where you can't. And that's super hard. It says, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And it is our promise as your parents to continue to show you a life with God at the center. I love that you use the word show. You can say all you want, but what you show will stick with him. We pray that you continue to carry him, that be Jesus, with you wherever you go and that you live a life with love in his heart. And so our charge to you both today is this, is that you would keep God with you wherever you go. 
in the grocery store, coming home from a late night at work, a moment of tension, wherever it is that God would be at the center that you'd be able to show this amazing young man, your family, you'd be able to show Noah, Jesus. And as much as you talk about Jesus, he would grow up one day and say that I saw Jesus in my parents. And so I want to do this communally. It's something powerful that when we have a chance to pray over, that we have a chance to pray with and pray for our friends in our community. Because this is what we are. We're a community. It's just us here, okay? It really is. There's, nobody's perfect. Nobody's got it all figured out. But together, I think we can get some traction, don't you? And so that's how we're going to do it. And so I, I would say this. If you're a parent here, would you stand up? Will you do me a favor? Will you stand up if you're a parent here right now? Maybe even a grandparent, right? Or, 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 or you help with kids at all, in any way at all. And, and that you would almost extend your arm. This is like a posture thing. You'd extend your arm toward Kevin and Kristen and really toward Noah. And that we would pray together as a community right now. This is a sacred privilege we get to do. And that we would pray a blessing over Noah. We'd pray power over his parents. Father, we do this now. We pray, Lord, we lift Noah up to you, God. We pray, um, God, that we recognize what a great gift he is to his parents and to his families. God, but we, we pray this too, God, that you would give them the power to dedicate his life back to you in this way, that they would show Noah the way they love you, Jesus. They would show Noah the way they love others. God, they would show Noah the way that they follow you and trust you when it's easy, God, on the mountaintops and those perspectives and in the valleys where you grow us deeply. God, I pray this over them right now. We pray a blessing as a community in a way that maybe they can't even imagine. It's unimaginable, unspeakable by your work upstream in the life of Noah right now for great things. So we pray for this young man, God, that you do great, beautiful things and we dedicate his life to you, Jesus, and we ask for power for these parents. In your mighty name, Jesus, we ask all these things and as a community we say in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Cool. God bless you guys, man. Thank them so much for your courage to come up and do this. Love you guys. What? You want to walk? Hey, buddy. Good job, man. Cool. Thank you guys. Isn't that cool we get a chance to do that stuff? I love it, man. Give them a big hand again. This is like super, super cool. Hey, we've got Miss Heather is going to come on right. up and share what's Son? happening around here. You can well, kick I have me to right just up. say how beautiful that was. Isn't that and cool? That, um, and this is just totally a prompting, so don't... Yeah, okay, no, go gonna, for it. Um, we may not ask you to come up again, but go ahead and say whatever you want. I'm just kidding. And I'm then, just messing around. I know. Um, that is beautiful, and it yeah. was exactly what was done over my baby girl, Chantel, 25 years ago. Who was just singing up here on this side of the stage, right? And Chantel, come up here for a second. And um, that is what a church community does and what Jesus can do. Yeah. This is my beautiful girl, Chantel, and part of my story is I had Chantel at a very young age and I had lots of challenges, And um, but through Christ and what he can do and what he can do through raising our children, if we put our faith and hope in him, can do miraculous things. And one of my prayers has always been that she uses her gift on stage for Jesus and to see her here this morning doing that is just a all glory to God, so. That's awesome. Love you more. I love that. Thank you for yes, sharing that, Heather. Yes, yes. So good morning. I'm Heather E. Bally. Thank you for the privilege to, to come and share some announcements this morning. Next week is our BIP baptism. And um, if there's anyone here that's feeling called or moved, what a great external outward motivation to share and tell people that you love Jesus. And so we have that next week. My baby niece is getting baptized next week. I'm so excited. I said, are you, are you excited to tell everyone you love Jesus? She's like, I'm excited. So I hope you are too. Please join us. And again, if you are thinking about it, we'd love to pray with you about it, answer any questions. Feel free to sign up at the Hub or online. Also, April 17th, save the date, is our vision night. So um, attending, of course, our new lead pastor, Brian, who's now been with us eight months, uh, preparing to share the vision that he has for the church. It's an all-campus um, attendance at the Troy location, so please RSVP um, online or at the Hub. Also, elder recommendations are now posted. Please, for your recommendations, if you have anyone that's on your heart that is led you to believe that is someone that could help lead our flock and be there for us, um, please nominate them. So thank you this morning. Again, it's a beautiful morning. The beautiful sun is shining, and uh, it's a new way to come to Jesus. If you're feeling burdened this morning, you're in the perfect place. If you've had a hard week, you're in the perfect place. 
And today's message, it's going to be just about that, being poor in spirit. We bring nothing to him, and he gives us everything. So please, this morning, if you could get up just for a minute, stretch, and say good morning to someone, and say, uh, it's a good, beautiful morning. Cool. Isn't that fun? It's already been an awesome morning. I love it. We're not even 20 plus minutes into it, man. And kids getting dedicated, beautiful worship music. Oh, that was, me and Heather, that was amazing. Just re- being reminded of that. Isn't that crazy? Chantel leading us in worship, singing this morning. And her mom, right, had been praying over that for years. Isn't that crazy? How we pray over things and we pray over things and all of a sudden God brings those to fruition and just, you never know what God's up to and what kind of things he's working. So, Hey, I'd love to be able to take our offering at this moment. Uh, many of you give online, and I thank you for that so much. And it's an amazing thing, some reasons why. I'd love to show you just a pic of our K-Friends program. It's been a newer part of our ministry over just literally the past couple months that we've been expanding. Um, and it's an amazing thing. It's the pic here of one of their events that they had done uh, just probably just a few weeks back. I think we got it. It's going to be an amazing pic. You just wait. <laughs> Is building into the anticipation. Here we go, right here. It's, uh, this is actually the, the remodeled Cherry Hills. You ever bowl the Cherry Hills? Oh, there, right? Two of you, two bowlers in this play. <laughs> bowling. Yeah, there we go. It's funny, it, it was almost like we don't want to admit we bowl, but we love bowling or something, right? So, yeah, there, and, and we've pretty much gotten the place for free past couple months. Isn't that cool? Because they heard about what we're up to and what we're doing. So go bowling there and thank them there because they're helping bless our church. And uh, just a super, super amazing ministry and things are happening. And I just want to encourage you, as you're, as you're giving to this place, I always want to remind you, you're giving into people's lives. Many of you do that online. We can go ahead and show up the slide for that. So many of you give online uh, like we do too. Uh, and and that's, that's an amazing thing to do. So I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And it's a way we worship, not just dedicating kids and, and doing ministry and all sorts of stuff, but you're making ministry possible in a profound way. I, I'll even give you an example. I just did a phone call yesterday uh, that was a difficult one. Part of what I have to do is or do funerals and memorial services and, and for a 39-year-old man. That'll be next Saturday at 11. And when I go there, I carry the mantle of carrying this church with me. And I want you to know that you make these things possible for us to minister and love and care for people in some of their worst moments. And I want to tell you, thank you, honestly. I mean that. I'm not just saying that. It's not lip service. That is a sincere thank you from the bottom of my heart um, that we are ministering to people all over the place all the time. And you're a big part of that. So I just wanted to tell you that. Well, today we're talking about this idea, this new series of Becoming. Uh, what it means to, to become something great. Jesus had a design and a, a desire in his heart and soul that he would bring a kingdom that would say in Hebrews would have no end. He was going to start a work that only he could finish in our life, and it was going to be something beautiful, just like even Heather had shared up here with Chantel, this amazing thing, watching God work in our lives, and not just our lives, but the lives of generations, even why we dedicate children here. We believe God is a generational God. And the things that he does are incredible. And it's amazing, Jesus says, so when we pray together, we almost want to pray this way to the God that's creating this kingdom. It says this, says, our Father, right, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. It's really, if you inverted the statement, it's bringing a little bit of heaven to earth. This is an amazing thing. We stop and we consider this reality. This is like a, a, a blessing. In fact, it's verses that we're going to get into today in Matthew, the Beatitudes, which kind of talk about the values or the ways that we are to be in the kingdom. Like if, if there is a kingdom, we would be subjects, sons and daughters in this kingdom, princes and princesses in this kingdom, if you would. And it says, blessed in this kingdom are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed. And so there's these two words we're going to talk about today, and and the kind of contrast blessed and poor in the same statement. 
doesn't always equate, does it? Doesn't quite make sense logically to us when we think about it in that way. But before we go too much further in that, we have to kind of define what it means to be blessed. What is Jesus going to be talking about when we read through the Beatitudes? What does it mean to actually be blessed? If you do hashtag blessed on Instagram or anything, you're going to get people like their new car, their new house, their new sunglasses, their on vacation, they're, they're whatever, right? You're, you're going to go through, and sometimes you want to be like, hashtag shut it if you're not on vacation. <laughs> hashtag keep it to yourself, all right? There comes these moments. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Keep, keep posting these great things, you know? Go ahead. We're cheering you on. <laughs> hashtag bless, this idea of blessed, and what it means to be blessed. And there are these moments. I remember my brother-in-law, when Top Golf came to Auburn Hills, he goes, dude, we are so blessed. <laughs> I was like, serious? He goes, yeah, like deeply blessed, man, to have Top Golf. I'm like, okay, it is so much fun. But the idea of blessed, we think about things or stuff or adventures that we go on. Or like an adventure, I just want, I want to show you a little clip with my sons. It was so fun. We went to Hollywood Studios. Ron, boy, hard to fight. Oh, Taylor, oh, oh, hey, oh, 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 down. Oh, what oh, did you have up and down? Okay. You can, you, yeah. Marie was holding the video. I don't know if the camera fell or what happened there. You can always hear she's it's, Everyone knows. Was Maria with you? And uh, we just had an amazing time. Like, it, we felt blessed to be with our kids and to experience something like that, right? And it's amazing to think of blessed. But what is the nature of blessed? What, what does it mean to be blessed? It, it, it's interesting. And in, in Matthew, it takes off, and there's just a verse here. It says this about the nature of blessing. To be blessed is to, actually, in the New Testament, makairos means to have the favor of God on you, is what it's saying. But it's interesting. Matthew says this, is that he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In this agrarian culture there would have been farming, agriculture, right? like, wait a minute, so the ones that are righteous, they get the rain and the sun, and the ones that are unrighteous and ungodly, they do too. They both get blessings. And, and, and it begins to get a bit confusing when you think about it through that lens. Think about it this way. When you pray, maybe, and I've seen this, people praying for a child, and they receive one. And I've prayed with people, and they've been praying for a child. They've not received one. People are praying for health, and their health turns the corner. And there are people that are praying for health to turn the corner, and it does not. And I end up in a spot like I am next Saturday at 11 a.m. at a funeral home. And it's hard to understand when you get down to the brass tacks of it, right? You get real practical in those moments. And it's like, what does this mean to be blessed then? God, what are you talking about? What is the real nature of blessing? Where does it come from? What does it mean? How do we understand it better? Because in the Beatitudes, it's talking about it several times. It says, blessed is this, blessed is that. And we're going to read through that. But we have to understand the nature of this idea about blessed. And it's interesting here in Matthew, a little bit further, it says this. Then the king will say to those, because we're talking about this kingdom, this blessed kingdom, to those on his right, that would mean relationship. Jesus currently sits at the right hand of the Father, that scripture says. It means he's the son of the father in relationship. Come, you who are blessed by my father. It's saying the idea of being blessed really means in relationship. It means less about the stuff we get, the moments we have. Those are incredible. Those would feel like blessings, but to intrinsically be blessed is really intrinsically communicating about relationship. It's interesting too, Asaph, this would have been a singer, a seer. This would have been somebody in David's court. He was a psalmist that he wrote. And he says this, Surely God is good to Israel, or surely God blesses Israel to those who are pure in heart. What about those that are super righteous? Those that never make a mistake. Those that never sin. They never, you know, they never curse anybody out in traffic. They don't cheat on their taxes. They stop at every stoplight. You know, they... I, how many of you here are rule followers, right? And how many are not? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? So we're here. We don't clap for ourselves because we're not rule followers. That irritates the rule followers even more. <laughs> and and Asaph was a rule follower. He's like, what about me? And, and he goes on in Psalms 73, and he's saying, man, I, I, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've 
been good and I've, I, I, I've, I've done all the things I'm supposed to do, yet I'm in torment and yet I have pain. And, and here they are. Look at them over there. They're, they're like evil, man. They're a mess and they're blessed. Don't you hate that? Have you ever had people that you're like, why are they getting blessed? And you pray to God, you're like, God, I got a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about. But first, I want to talk about the Smiths. They are a mess, God, and you keep blessing them, right? You admit it. We feel this way. We look because we're thinking this is an equation, but blessing is speaking of something different. And Asaph brings this home. He says he has this revelation in Psalms. He says, I realize when I see the bigger picture, it's not about this stuff. There's an eternal perspective. There's a bigger perspective, God, that you're wanting to share, and it's this. He says, yet I am always with you, blessing, relationship. You hold me by my right hand, blessing. I'm in relationship with you, God, and nothing can take that away. That's why David says, whether I make my bed in heaven or Sheol, hell, wherever I am, you are with me. This is the greatest blessing you can get. You guide me with your counsel, the counsel of God, blessing. And afterward, you will take me into glory. My eternity is secured in you, blessing. Have we cleared up a little bit what Scripture is saying for blessing? It's not bad to celebrate in the things we have, the events that occur, but ultimately in this human life, and life will turn on us, life will fail us, life will get shaky, life will sucker punch us even. And the real blessing Asaph is getting at, Matthew is getting at, Jesus is getting at, is the blessing to be in relationship with God. This is the ultimate, it's literally what we're praying for. It's literally what their letter they wrote for little Noah. They're praying that wherever he would go, God would be with him. Not that God would give him good stuff. God would give him a great car. God would give him a good job. Those are all good things to pray for and work for. But ultimately, they're like, they're saying, we just want God to be with our son. If we can't be with him when he's hurting and crying, God, will you comfort him? God, if he's discouraged and losing hope and we are, are trying to encourage him, God, would your spirit encourage him in his soul? Are you seeing this now? This is true blessing, if you would, in that way. And it's important that we just had to clear that up and make that understandable as we talk about this. And it, it, it's relationship. I think about it now. I get the privilege to have a father-in-law that I call like my dad number two, my main dad. And it's not even like what I can get from them, but can I be with them? Can I listen to them? Can I learn from them? Can I hear their voice? Can I talk to them? Can I be in relationship with them? This is the ultimate blessing. It's not the stuff we get to do, and that's really cool, and all of it is amazing, but it's the very essence of being in relationship together is what matters most. Jesus says, in my kingdom, I want you to become greater and greater. I want you to do amazing things your subjects in my kingdom, your daughters in my kingdom, your sons in my kingdom, for those that know the, the, the Father, for those that have professed Jesus is their Savior, for those that put their faith in Jesus, you become part of this kingdom of God. And he says, but here's the way of my kingdom. He goes, you are going to be blessed. He uses this word blessed several times. You're going to be blessed, but it's not going to be like the way you think. The way that you come to me, the way that you approach me in relationship is different than what you think to be blessed. And the Beatitudes, here they are in Matthew chapter 5, from the Sermon on the Mount, it says, and this is what we're going to be going through, really in the series, is how to become more like Jesus, how to become subjects or part of his kingdom. What does that look like? And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. It seems awkward just to even read it. It doesn't make sense at first. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And stylistic in the Beatitudes they use this phrase at the beginning, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, blessed those are poor in spirit, right? And at the very end, blessed those are poor in spirit. And again, in this other idea, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's stylistic, it's inclusive, it's putting this all together. Blessed or happy or in relationship are those. And this first one we're going to look at today, just look at that for a minute and, and leave it up there as we read through this. It's an interesting one because blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's an interesting thing just to consider this idea. 
The idea of poor, the idea of poor in spirit. Like, what does that actually mean? Does that mean like poor in spirit, you don't have a lot of ambition? Does it mean poor in spirit, you don't really have a lot of oomph in you, like you're not a go-getter? Poor in spirit maybe means you're just, you never really fit in. You know, poor in spirit, you're not valuable, you're not worthy, you're not, you know, maybe is that what Jesus is referring to? But we know that can't be true the reality that maybe you feel like you're of no value. Poor in spirit, you're, you're, you're worthless. You're of no value. You have no credibility to you. Nobody wants you. Nobody wants to be in relationship with you. And, and we've all felt like this at moments. This idea of being poor. Poor in that way, but that's not what God's talking about. Because think about John three sixteen. For God so loved the world and everybody in it that he gave his only begotten son. Why? Because he saw value in you and I and he loved us. That we're made in the image of God that we are image bearers of God, that he stoops down from the dust of the ground and he, he breathes into us in an intimate way and he, and, he, and he animates us through his spirit and we become human life, human beings, right? Like there's this intrinsic way that God assigns and ascribes value to you and I. So it can't be that. And it's interesting and we can feel like that at moments. I, I mean, I always remember this moment and I try to get out of my mind, but I had a teacher that literally told me I was a loser and the biggest loser he ever knew. And it's always stuck in my life, in my head. You ever have a tape that wants to play and play? And it takes a lot of work to take the tape out and throw it away. And that's what God wants. He wants to take the tape out and throw it away and replace it. But that's not what we're talking about, poor in spirit that way either. It means this. Poor in spirit literally means poverty in the spirit. Not poverty in the life you live, but poverty in the spirit you have, your spirit. And this is an interesting thing, to actually be bankrupt in the spirit, to be spiritually bankrupt, if you would. Jesus is saying, blessed are those that come that are poor in spirit. They're bankrupt in their spirit. Those are the ones that are actually happy, they're in a relationship, they have a peace that'll pass all understanding, This doesn't make sense to us when we first read it and understand it. It's interesting. There's a story of a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus that Jesus tells. And some question, is this a parable or is it a true event or based on true events? And a lot of theologians think it's a true story. And and, and Jesus tells a story that there's this rich man. He's in purple fine linen. He has food. He has everything that he wants and could desire. There's nothing really that he needs in this world at all. And, and, and he's got everything. And Lazarus is begging. He's got sores. It says that even the dogs would lick his sores. He had nothing. There was almost like this gulf fixed between them societally. Okay? This was the have. This would be considered the have-nots. Make sense? It's there. And they both pass away, Jesus says. And all of a sudden, the rich man finds himself in torment. He finds himself yearning and thirsting and desiring. He looks across this great gulf fix and he sees in Abraham's bosom. He sees over here, scripture says, the poor man, Lazarus, the beggar who is begging no more. And he begs him, he says, he says just, just like give me some water on the tip of my tongue or go tell my brothers. I have five brothers. Go tell them of what is going on here now that they would choose you, God. And it's amazing to think about both these men, both when you look at them, One seemed to have nothing and one seemed to have everything, but it flipped the script and all of a sudden it seems like one now has everything and one has nothing. Because when the one had nothing, he was poor in spirit. He actually had everything because he was holding strongly in his faith in God. And there's this eternal perspective. Asaph says, early read in Psalm 70, there's this eternal perspective to be in relationship with God was the eternal blessing. It was the best thing. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit, poor in posture, Think about this verse again, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We describe this kingdom with no end, a kingdom of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness and goodness and mercy and power and unbelievable, unimaginable things. A kingdom with no end, a kingdom that Jesus uh, gives resurrecting life to that we talked about in Easter. This kingdom is unbelievable and amazing, but it's a kingdom inherited to those that are poor in spirit. What? What? Doesn't that sound unique to you when you hear that? You, you mean the kingdom is not, because we think blessed by not being poor. We think the blessed are those that are strong in spirit. Blessed are those that are smart. Blessed are those that are wealthy. Blessed are those that are this and this and this. And it goes on. And this idea of being blessed, 
And, and it's really interesting because when Jesus goes on, we talk about this, we understand, blessed by not being poor. Sometimes we put our, our blessings in our wealth. In fact, there's this, there's this little paradigm. They show that most people focus on their financial scenario, right? And then they focus on their intellectual scenario and their physical scenario, and then relational they get to, and then maybe spiritual. And God's saying, no, 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 you gotta flip it this way. You have to come to me like you're really poor in spirit. You have to come to me spiritually bankrupt, as if you had nothing, needing everything. And this is what's amazing about Jesus. You come to him with nothing, and he gives you everything. And he's saying, put spiritual first, then do relational, then worry about the physical, right? And, and then worry about the intellectual, and then get to the financial last if you have time. And that seems so opposite of how we do this. And it's amazing, even like the rich young ruler in Scripture, he comes to Jesus and he says, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? Like he sees Jesus and he's like, I want what you have. I'm watching you, man, bring life to those that were dying. You're healing those that had leprosy. You're helping the blind see. You're doing incredible things, Jesus. Like how can I be part of this? How can I be, do this? He says, simple. He says, you gotta keep the commandments. And the kid's like, I have, I've done that, Right? He's the rule follower. He's like Aesop was saying that, man, I've been pure at heart. I've been doing all that. He goes, good, go sell everything you have and you can follow me. And he put his head down and he turned this way and he moved. And it's amazing. Jesus isn't even telling you to sell everything you have. He's saying, what's more important to you? Can you come to me poor in spirit or are you insulated thinking that your wealth and the things around us, my home, my belongings, what I have, is that what is going to bring me great comfort? Is that what will bring me forever security? Is that what will I'll find my great strength? Is that what will make me blessed? And Jesus is asking us to dig deep in this moment. The Beatitudes sound beautiful until you put them into practice. You ever have anything that sounds amazing until you try it? You know, this is what happens to people January 1st. I am committed. I'm working out every day. I'm eating healthy. Nothing but broccoli in this house. You know what I mean? And then don't happen. Because to put it in practice is totally different. It's amazing just to stop and consider this in this moment. This idea of wealth. The rich young ruler goes, I can't do that. I, I, I don't know how to do that. You don't know how to give that up. But can I tell you, there comes a moment I've probably done, I would have to imagine, almost 300 funerals in my ministry career to date. And every time, do you know what I never hear? I never hear, ever, ever, people saying, man, I wish that he could have made more money. I wish he would have a chance to work a few more months or if he could have worked two more years. I really wish that. I, that never happens at all. And then I'll hear moments like this where they go deeper and they'll say, he was a great provider she did a great job at her career. They, they were a great provider, but they really weren't present at home. They, they put all their trust in their wealth. And I'm not saying it's bad to not pursue your career, become competent, amass things, but do it as a tool. Do it to love people, to bless people, to take care of your family. But when you come to God, if you truly want to be blessed, truly, if you really want to be blessed, you come poor in spirit. You come broken before God and say, God, in my soul, if I got really honest, there's nothing in the world that I could amass or wealth I could obtain, a career I could have that would backfill what it means to have you in my life, Jesus. And Jesus says, blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like this is the amazing thing. The Beatitudes are the antithesis against all the things that we put our dependence in. Not just our wealth, but even our self. We put our dependence on our own strength and our own being and who we are. We, 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 just, we, we do this often. We just say we're going to put it in our own strength in this own way. This is what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, and this is where the idea of even, and, and its extremity can go, is to narcissism. The legend of Narcissus. It's the guy that finds himself right in love and he's walking along one day and he's hanging out and He's sitting there and he looks over at a pond and he sees this pond and he sees a reflection and he falls in love with the reflection and out of love who he's in love with and his life begins to change and it gets destroyed in fact. And he put all this strength in self and the story and the moral of that story, the reality is Jesus is even saying, don't put your, your strength in yourself. 
You will let yourself down more than anyone else. You know who the biggest person that's ever going to let you down is? You. I mean, you're just going to let, it'll happen. Have you ever let yourself down? Don't you hate when you, have you ever talked trash to yourself in the mirror? (laughs) Private moment, but we have all done it, haven't we? You idiot. You know, you're talking and you're thinking like, who are you talking to in there? Myself. That's when I'm like, okay, take your time. (laughs) Yeah, on that moment, we, it doesn't it, it, it's annoying. We let our own self down in these moments. Jesus is saying, blessed is the poor in spirit. Not blessed is the strong in their wealth. Not blessed is the strong in their self. Like, not, not there. Not those people that they got it all figured out and they're, they're strong and they're capable and they're able. That's not the kind of kingdom he's trying to build. That's not the kind of place he's trying to do. He's sharing the Beatitudes. You know that he shared this Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, same Beatitudes in several spots in Scripture It's amazing because this was a message he wanted to get across to people so they understood. What does it mean to be part of the kingdom of God? He's like, I'm so glad you asked. He says, blessed or happy or in relationship are these people that are poor in spirit. Huh? Poor in spirit. Yeah, but for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Really? Blessed and happy in a relationship with God and to inherit the kingdom of heaven and the fruits of heaven? And and the centerpiece is to be poor in spirit. And it's so hard because we want to depend so much on ourself and our own strength. We can get through this. We can do this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, depend on him. Hold to him. Cleave to him. Grieve to him. Cry to him. Holler at him. Yell at him. Tell him. Let him know. Say, so God, I need you. I'm, I'm poor in spirit. I can't do this. God, I, I, I'd rather just come to you like this, man. My, my wealth and myself, I can't do this. God, help me know what it means to be poor in spirit before you. God says, those people, I'll direct their path. Like, those are the people who'll do that to. God abhors pride, and he lifts the humble up. Isn't that crazy? He takes the prideful and he pushes them to the side. He takes the humble and he elevates them in a profound way. This is what he does. I, I, I love Steve Andrews, who, by the way, is going to be here next week preaching around baptism. He just authored a book. And it, it's so cool, man. And this thing is called Surrounded by Wonder. And maybe he'll tell you more about it. But he talks about just the amazing things that God does when we come to God humbly, humble in heart. We don't come to God like, you know, like full of ourselves. And it's amazing. He jokes as their family. He goes, I might not be much, but I'm all I think about. (laughs) And he says he's always fighting against this paradigm in his head, right? We all are. Like, we want to be humble, but we think about ourselves often, all the time. Don't we often think about, I mean, think about how often we're thinking about ourselves and our money we got to make and our, uh, who we are and our own strength and our, and all these things. And we hold on to these. And there's so many amazing people in scripture. I think about David who screwed up relentlessly. Yet his humility before God would say, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Then I'll go out. Gideon, who is the least in the tribe of Manasseh, the least in his family, the runt of the litter, if you would. And God uses him to help take back Israel. I look at Mary Magdalene, somebody that was considered potentially a prostitute. She was demon-possessed. Nobody wanted her at all. And she becomes the first evangelist disciple in Scripture that we're even preaching from stages today because of part of the work that she did. She was poor in spirit before the Lord, right? Peter, a coward, becomes a martyr upside down. I look at Mother Mary, an unwed teenager that claimed that God was her father, right? Poor in spirit, and God lifts up and does amazing things. Blessed, and theirs was the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that crazy to think about? It's unbelievable we stop and consider this. And sometimes it's even our health, something we hold strong to. And maybe it's just my, my, my health. I'll, I'll, I'll hold on to that. Your body will betray you. Your wealth will betray you. You'll find out it's not as significant as you thought. My dad always says there's no U-Haul behind a hearse. He's never seen one. And it's so true to every funeral I've ever been part of. It matters not. Self-dependence, you will let yourself down. You just will. I remember in my 30s, I thought I was going to take over the world and found myself on the couch ready to cry and wig out. And Maria Googled it for me and said, you're having a thrysis, midlife crisis in your 30s. I'm like, no, this is supposed to happen in your 40s. <laughs> right? And now our health, and your health betrays you. Man, I, remember, I mean, I've like blown out my Achilles. I've got a disc issue. 
Somebody shoved me from off the stage one time. Like, I broke my foot. Like, you guys didn't know that's what happened. It was a worship leader. They're no longer here. But, you know, no, they didn't do that. That was all me. And our health betrays us. In April, I always think about my friend, Tommy Cusick. Every time I drive by Dixie and by Scott Lake Road, IQ Life Safety Systems, he, his family owned that. He was in his early 40s, like mid-40s, and came home from a trip in early April and had like a pain in his calf. And it was like a red spot, and he went and tried to figure out what it was. And weeks later, they discovered pancreatic cancer. And I'm doing his funeral in early May. And every time of this year, I always think of him. And he was an amazing person. He was a person that truly was poor in spirit. He had Jesus even up to the last minute, and he exuded that. And I watch this, and I think even health of a good person betrayed. Blessed by being poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're not blessed by trying to not be poor. We're blessed by actually being poor. The kingdom of God is upside down. It's different every single way, isn't it? Right? It, it, Jesus says these things. It's just crazy. It's like, wait a minute. The first, they're going to be last. And the last, they're going to be first. What? The humble, man, I'm going to lift them up. What about me trying to get ahead in life? Nope, I'm going to push back pride. And the poor in spirit, not the strong in their wealth, the strong in themselves, the strong in their health. Nope, nope, nope. I'm the maker of heaven and earth, and I dictate all those rules. He goes, but the poor in spirit, man, blessed are they in relationship with me, knowing that I'm with them and loving them and for them and around them. And I think this reality, blessed by being poor, is an amazing thing. It's knowing Jesus, really knowing Jesus, and even coming to Jesus, but knowing Jesus. And you know when you really know Jesus is when you offer and let him know more about you. What is it that you're struggling with right now that you'd want to let Jesus know about in your life? You'd say, I want Jesus to understand this and know this in my life. And just in a few moments, we're going to be taking communion. And it's an amazing time almost to go through this exercise and begin to understand what these words are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed and happy and at peace, even in troubles, having joy when there seems to be none around, feeling unconditional love and understanding what that means. These are the amazing things to be blessed, but we're poor in spirit. We come to God saying, God, you know me, you understand me what I'm struggling with. God, you know what's happening to me right now. And when Jesus does this amazing thing, as we reveal these things to Jesus, which he already knows, Jesus says, come to me. You look heavy laden, you look burdened. Come to me and find rest. Come to me and sit with me. And let me counsel you. Let me talk with you. It's amazing that we come to Jesus and we find the grace of Jesus Christ. We find his grace, which is unmerited favor. It's unearned. There's nothing you could have done for it outside of came poor in spirit. How do you show up and afford the fruits of the spirit? How do you get so much love in your life? I've been looking for that. How do you get peace that passes all understanding? How, how are you getting this in your life? Oh, it's easy. I just came totally bankrupt before Jesus. You didn't bring him anything. You didn't do anything. No, I had nothing. It was worthless what I had. But I did this. I came open-handed and I left my arms full more than I could even have imagined. Jesus did that for you? Yeah, he did that for me. We know Jesus. We come to Jesus. We surrender to Jesus. And he changes everything in our life. I love my friend Steve. He's here today. And we're going to have him up in a few weeks to hear his whole story. It's unbelievable. Steve and I were texting and talking a little bit just about his story. And just some years back, it's amazing when you were texting with me and we were talking, is just that you had nothing. Life brought you to kind of the end there in that moment and you just you said you got invited to an addictions ministry and on Tuesday night and my parents are part of that thing and you go there and you, you said you got down on your knees and you just kind of surrendered to Jesus like this you came poor in spirit it's amazing your words you said you stood up feeling that God gave you a wave of love and grace over your life and started changing the direction blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven isn't that incredible to stop and think about? Steve could sit here and tell a story. I pulled myself up my, my bootstraps. I did it on my own. I turned my life around and my own strength and everything, but nope. He came poor in spirit. 
This is what Jesus does. I don't know if you received, did you receive one of these communion cups when he came in? This is our method of challenging you to see how talented you are pulling these back. They're tricky. I'm going to give you a second to pull that back. And of course, I would tease you and then have trouble with this. And I want to read to you the Lord Jesus does this amazing thing. He gives us communion, the opportunity to take a moment and pause in our life and where we are and to surrender to Jesus. That we have an opportunity to say, Jesus, you know me in my brokenness. God, you know me in my sin I'm struggling with. God, you know me in maybe my pride, my unwillingness to let my guard down and surrender to you. God, you know me. God, maybe you know me right now that I need to take a step of faith and get baptized next week. And I'm worried, I'm nervous, I feel unworthy. To know Jesus, Jesus lets himself be known back to us. He gives himself for us. He dies on a cross for you and I. And so as we come to Jesus today, come poor in spirit. Come open-handed, broken in spirit, and say, God, I really deep down spiritually, I don't have much, but you have everything. And if I come to you with nothing, I experience everything with you. Jesus answered this in Matthew 26, verse 26. He says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And while he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. We do this in remembrance of him. We take his body. The same way, in the same manner, then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. But this is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He says, You do this and you drink this in my name, and you become family. It's amazing what Jesus Christ does in our lives and for us. He changes us. He has a vision for our life, a vision of us becoming one, becoming a kingdom with no end, becoming a kingdom that shines its light bright like a city on a hill, becoming a church that grows, becoming part of one of six campuses that's growing through Metro Detroit and amazing things are happening. Stories are being told, lives are being changed, like just unbelievable, but how does it get started? Jesus says, let me tell you, blessed are those people. Blessed is Kensington Clarkston, blessed is Kensington Church, blessed are the people in there when they come poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I just want to pray for us, and Jimmy's going to lead us in the song, Be Thou Vision, and this reality of God, give us a new vision for our life, a fresh vision for our life that begins with us coming open-handed, walking to you with nothing, but leaving with everything. Jesus, help us understand the vision you have for our life. Change our lives and let us come to you poor in spirit because then we get the kingdom of heaven in a way we'd never imagine. May you bless Christ in your name. And all said, amen.
heaven's joy, oh bright heaven's sun, a heart of my own heart, whatever be from, still be my vision, oh ruler of
part of my world So take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours Amen Come on, he's good, isn't he? Oh, that is the weakest celebration of a good God I've ever heard. Hey, he's good, isn't he? Woo. Hey, we're so glad that you were with us this morning. Hey, if God's doing something in your life and you need prayer to talk to somebody, the prayer team is down front. This is an, an amazing thing. If you've not ever had someone pray over you, today's your day. Come on, come forward and have someone pray over you. It's the best thing you could do to end your morning here with us. If you've got questions about things going on, visit the Hub. Baptism's next week. Let's get you signed up for that. Otherwise, let's give our all to Jesus, not just our Sundays. That starts as soon as you leave these doors. Go have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.